to welcome you to today's conference in Mexico. When talking about Latin America, it is essential to refer to Mexico long centuries ago, uh, Virreinato de España, and today a leading country with a clear view of its neighbors in Central America. I remember the years of the wars in the Isthmus, largely in the 80s, with violent uprisings in Nicaragua and El Salvador, minor wars in Guatemala and Honduras, compounded a very worrisome outlook. Of course, Fidel was very much involved in all this movement. My country, Costa Rica, was exempted from the ravaging wars, except for the displaced Nicaraguan, Honduran, and Salvadorian peoples who sought refuge in my country. Mexico led then the Contadora Group with some nations of South America as a diplomatic initiative to pacify the countries in war. But Contadora left a, a bad aftertaste in most of the Central American people. Thank God we're far past those years, and since the administration of Vicente Fox, some economic initiatives were adopted, including an oil refinery for the benefit of the Isthmus. By the way, I don't know if uh, the uh, oil refinery was ever... No. I'm sorry. You know, those are politicians. You know, what do you expect? Um, uh, more of this horizon I learned from uh, my esteemed friend Jorge Castañeda, who recently spoke in Hudson about uh, his views and prognosis vis-a-vis -vis the region. And now this conference gives us the opportunity to learn of today's Mexico, including the bad and the ugly, but above all, the mostly promising land. Our speakers are highly distinguished specialists, starting with Jorge Guajardo, a proven high caliber Mexican diplomat, followed by a leading journalist from Costa Rica and Latin America, Armando Gonzalez, who, by the way, is my boss at La Nación, the newspaper for which I have written since 1983. No one more qualified than Armando to speak about basic rights and the long chain of Mexican journalists murdered, adding one more yesterday. Finally, my esteemed colleague at Hudson, Dr. David Murray, an undisputed authority in the scary world of trucks will tell us of this phenomena in Mexico. After these three presentations, we'll open a space for questions and comments. We thank Rachel Cox, our very able director of events, as well as my compadre Gil Cavazos and his colleagues in the financial department of our institution. And personally, my gratitude to Dr. John Walters, Vice President of Hudson, for his backing of our programs. And without any further ado, I turn the mic to my buen amigo, Jorge Guajardo. Don Jorge. Thank you, Ambassador Dan Blumen. If I may, I'll uh, speak uh, from my chair, if that's okay, with the audience. And basically what I want to do is sort of lay uh, the groundwork or sort of let you know where Mexico came from and where we are now so that we can better understand what we face going forward. Mexico, as many of you may or may not know, was a one-party system, a one-party government up to the year 2000. Towards the end of the last millennium, Mexico was one of the two 
longest lasting single party systems in the world. The other one being the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Both lasted 71 years. So Mexico, in any way you look at it, the first thing that you have to realize is that Mexico is undergoing a transition towards democracy. That transition began probably uh, in the late 80s during the Carlos Salinas de Gortari administration when he took the bold step of starting to remove the government from the productive sector in Mexico. He started mass privatizations, started by privatizing anything from the banking sector, the steel, most of the state-owned enterprises going through hotels, a whorehouse came up to the things that uh, the government owned and, and privatized. So he started removing the government from everyday life in Mexico, and that was seen as a big first step towards dem democratization of the country. As in most countries that have a big uh, state-owned sector, it's mostly used for patronage or political control. So when you start extracting the government from the productive sector, a big step is taken towards democratization. And in order to make sure that's stuck, he began the negotiations for the free trade agreement, for the North American free trade agreement. And the reason that was important is because an essential part of the agreement was that the state would not participate in many of the areas that were considered for open trade. So therefore, that was a way to ensure that the state would never go back to being a big actor in the productive sector in Mexico. So that was the beginning of Mexico's transition towards democratization, in which after living in a one-party state that controlled every aspect of life, all of a sudden, at least they started to extract themselves from the productive side. Also, during the Salinas de Gortari administration, we saw the first opposition candidate win a state governorship. Prior to that, the PRI, the governing party, won every single governorship, uh, most of the municipalities. So that was the first time we, we saw an opposition party win in Baja California. That was a pun, and the, and the governor then, the elected governor was uh, Ernesto Rufo. That led us to the presidency of Ernesto Cedillo. That was uh, 1994 to 2000. That was the other major leap towards the, in the process of democratization. If Salinas de Gortari started by extracting the government from the productive sector, Cedillo continued by extracting the government from the electoral process. So he established or he contributed together with the opposition and established credible electoral authorities, an independent electoral institute that oversaw elections that led to in 1997 for the first time having a Congress in which the PRI, the governing party, did not control the majority. That was a big breakthrough in, in Mexico. It was the first sign, if you will, of accountability, which led to the year 2000, when Vicente Fox was elected, the first president from the opposition. And what we in Mexico thought was a big leap towards democratization. I, I was a member. I am a member still of the opposition. We're back in the opposition, but I was a member of the opposition. I remember that election in the year 2000. It was not that much different, if you will, as being a, an African-American citizen in the United States and witnessing the election of Barack Obama. The sense that the impossible had finally been attained, that uh, what was seen as a dream was then a reality, and we assumed that everything had already happened and that there was no going back and it was all going forward. Not very different <laughs> from what we see now in the United States. So from that, we go through the Fox administration when he had to govern with a PRI-controlled Congress. And being the first president from the opposition, I guess he was somewhat reluctant to undo or <coughs> dismantle the machinery that was left in place by the PRI for the simple reason that he thought it would be difficult to govern 
the country without a majority in Congress, without uh, controlling most of the state legislatures or the state governorships. So he pretty much left the machinery, the PRI machinery in place. And by the machinery, I mean most of the the unions, the vested interests, they mostly remain, but we had an opposition government. And we continued moving, uh, or thought we were moving towards uh, democratization, leading to the presidency of Felipe Calderón in 2006, again, upon president handing over the presidency to another pan, and that we thought was a consolidation of the transition to democracy. That was it. There was no turning back. We guaranteed that a, uh, a pan administration could hand over power to the pan administration. What more proof did you want to know the country had moved in the right direction? Unfortunately, we later learned, or are learning as we speak, that in order to envision democracy, at least as it pertains in Mexico, you should think of it as a stool that rests in three legs. One leg is a free economy, which we have. The other leg would be free elections, which we somewhat have, but there is one person, one vote. And the third leg would be rule of law. Unfortunately, we don't have that yet. Mexico is lacking in the area of rule of law. It's still a big obstacle to overcome, if you will. And that leads us to the present day. If you read the newspapers in Mexico, Today, or this past week, or this past month, unfortunately, you will see a Mexico that is very similar to the Mexico that was in place 30 years ago. And the big news would be massive corruption, with governors being uh, arrested, unfortunately, outside of Mexico, because they can't be arrested in Mexico. So we have a governor that was arrested in Guatemala, the other one was in Panama, the other one in Italy, not in Mexico. So, so there is that impunity in terms of uh, government corruption. We have electoral fraud at the state level. We have we just had elections in three states in Mexico on June fourth. I'm sorry, in four three states for governorship. Out of those three, two have been contested after the election, as the opposition claims there was massive fraud, and to some degree they've been able to prove that. So we still have that hurdle to overcome. We have intimidation and assassination of journalists. Just this year, seven uh, journalists have been killed. It may not be, or at least it hasn't been proven, and I personally don't think that it's the state killing them, but the fact that no one has been brought to justice in any of the seven homicides gives you an idea of the impunity in the country and the lack of consequences for going after a sacred, uh, if you will, sector of society, which is the media. And another thing we see a lot of is spying. There was a big uh, news in, in the New York Times that Mexico had acquired spying equipment, sophisticated buying equipment that was technically going to be used to fight organized crime. It turned out that most of it was directed against political opponents and civil society activists. So we see the same things that characterized the country 30 years ago. And all of it, in one way or another, can be traced back to the concept of impunity and the lack of the rule of law. The fact of the matter is that in present day Mexico, very few people think that a criminal will face justice. 
And when you have that situation, everything else starts corroding. So, for instance, I, I, I just mentioned that one of the things we accomplished was free and fair elections. We had a, an independent electoral system that oversaw elections, that oversaw a transition to an opposition party. But just in a poll released today, one out of every two Mexicans, 50% of Mexico, does not believe in, in the impartiality of the electoral system. And the reason they don't believe in the impartiality of the electoral system goes back to the same reason. Because in Mexico, there is this thinking, or people are convinced that those who break the law do not pay the consequences. So the lacking of the rule of law, the concept of impunity, is what is setting us back and not letting us accomplish the third leg of democracy moving that would give us the power to move forward and face all the other challenges that the country faces in terms of facing organized crime, facing uh, a free media, et cetera. So, so this is what we have in Mexico right now. <laughs> this is what we're facing. I'm going to leave it here to let my colleagues do their presentations, which will further go on the subject, on this subject, and then we probably in the stage of questions and answers, we can further elaborate. <coughs> Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for your interest in affairs that are so dear to us as Latin Americans. Um, before taking the plane for Washington yesterday, I interviewed one of our most veteran uh, diplomats in Costa Rica. And we spoke, El Embajador Edgar, eh, no, eh, Ugarte. Ugalde, Ugalde, Edgar Ugalde. He's a very uh, experienced uh, ambassador in Costa Rica's Foreign Service. And we talked about a topic he knows very well, uh, which is the conflicts we constantly have with our neighbor to the north, which is Nicaragua. Because he has worked a lot on those conflicts. And what Ambassador Ugalde uh, said in that interview is our main problem is that we don't know them well enough. And I think that's true in many other bordering countries. And uh, getting to know each other well enough uh, to be constructive is very important. So I want to thank the Hudson Institute for this initiative, uh, for allowing us to speak to you about Latin America. Uh, Mexico has come a long way. And the ambassador pointed to some uh, important moments in that development, but it is still developing. Uh, and it has come a long way in its politics and also in its press, which is what I am here to talk to you about. And it's fortunate that I speak after the ambassador and before uh, Mr. Murray, because what I am going to uh, deal on um, it is pretty much a hinge between the two things because it has to do with Mexico's transition to, dem to a more democratic society and it has to do with Mexico's drug tragedy. Um, and I am going to speak from the perspective of a journalist about what is happening to my colleagues. Now you may ask, what is a Costa Rican journalist uh, doing here talking about uh, what is happen happening with journalism in Mexico? Well, I, am, I have very close ties to Mexico, and I have very close ties to uh, the efforts for freedom of the press throughout Latin America. I have participated intensely in the Inter-American Press Association, in its legal committee, in its executive committee, in its board of directors. I've, uh, I've been involved as a speaker and in many other ways with, with these topics. So that's, those are my credentials, and they are modest, but... Uh, um, may prove to be sufficient for what I have been asked to uh, speak about. Um, Mexico has come a long way, and I would disagree with the ambassador in one aspect. He said that reading a newspaper today would be like reading a newspaper 30 years ago, and we were talking in the green room, and I told him, no, ambassador, that's not the way. It used to be 30 years ago, because 30 years ago, they might have censored a lot of what they would publish today. 
and we started remembering the cases of the first rebels, like El Norte, a newspaper in the north from which later was born Reforma, which is a very independent newspaper in Mexico today. Um, the papers, even the ones that still exist, like Excelsior, Universal, that come from way back then, uh, way back then would not have published many of the things they do publish today. So there has been also um, uh, progress in freedom of the press, and there are many, many. The ambassador might remember Jacobo Sabludowski, who was a, a very prominent journalist, but not as independent as Aristegui maybe today, uh, not as uh, assertive of opposition views. Uh, so there has been progress in, uh, in freedom of the press, and that progress has to do a lot with uh, the loosening of the political control that the PRI had, which was truly all-encompassing. Uh, and that means the press also. And uh, the practices that were common in Mexico in those days were that a journalist would cover a beat, uh, like, let's say, the uh, oil company, the petroleum industry, Pemex, and uh, they would have a salary. So I would be my newspaper's correspondent with Pemex, and I would get a salary from Pemex. And this was, oh yeah, this was standard practice. And it happened throughout Mexican institutions, okay? Um, so the state was involved, the government was involved in limiting freedom of the press. Uh, this has loosened somewhat. And you have to remember that pressure on the press usually comes from either a government, um, economic pressures, um, and then there's violence. Violence, which in Latin America takes basically two forms, guerrillas and paramilitaries, which is the case of Colombia, and the drug cartels. Okay. So that's where pressure comes from uh, on journalists in Latin America and throughout the world. There are some, some of these aspects you could see almost everywhere. Um, in Costa Rica, economic pressure, well, a state-owned bank recently decided that it was not going to advertise in my newspaper anymore because it didn't like what we published. But I went to the Supreme Court. I personally argued the case, and we won 7-0. And that state-owned bank has to <laughs> um, uh, consider us in equal terms uh, when developing its uh, advertisement strategy. So then you have that type of pressure everywhere. But the difference is that in Costa Rica, you have a court system that says, no, that's not, that's foul. Okay, you, can, you can't do that. Um, in Mexico, that has also loosened. Basically, the source of pressure, terrible pressure, of censorship and of self-censorship in the Mexican press are the drug cartels. In Colombia, you had the military, the paramilitary, you had the guerrillas and the drug cartels, and sometimes you couldn't tell the guerrillas or the paramilitary and the drug cartels apart because they were pretty much the same thing. Um, but that has uh, significantly subsided. Uh, in Mexico, at the same time, it has become more and more important and prominent. This is not to say that the state is completely out of the business of pressuring journalists. And yes, the recent uh, espionage uh, situation the ambassador was uh, mentioning had to do with um, um, a software bought by the Mexican government from Israel. It's a software called Pegasus, or Pegasus, how do you pronounce it in English? I'm not sure. The Pegasus? Pegasus, okay, the mythological horse. Okay, wings horse. Um, so the Pegasus system, basically what allowed the government was to get into your uh, smartphone and use it as a camera against you, as a recorder against you, or transmitter against you, and of course intervene all your communications of all types. Um, it was sold by this Israeli company to Mexico on the condition in the contract that it would only be used for crime 
uh, for fighting crime for law enforcement? Uh, well, it turns out, and this is absolutely proven, that it was used to spy, yes, on activists and um, a gentleman who helped write a law against corruption, human rights activists, but also journalists. So there were journalists who were being spied with Pegasus. Now, what we can't say right now is that it was a concerted government effort coming from the highest levels of the government down, because the only thing that has been proven is that the software was used to uh, spy on these people. How was that proven? Well, the malware or spyware, whatever you call it, that was implanted in the phones uh, leads directly to that software. So there's no doubt that the software was used to spy. What we can't say is that it wasn't uh, some rogue officer in, uh, in a Mexican uh, police um, institution who had access to the program. And, but it's pretty clear that if you're, if you're listening in on journalists, uh, especially prominent journalists like um, Aristegui, a woman who has been a very prominent for her um, very critical reporting, um, well, it's pretty clear that the people that are interested in knowing that are not just you know some rogue sergeant in in a back office somewhere who had access to to software, but that's still under investigation. So what is proven is that they were listening. Uh, what is not clear is how high up it goes or whether how how concerted the the effort was. But it is proven that it, they were listening. Um, pressure on journalists, by the way, now that I mentioned uh, Aristegui, um, also manifests itself in in other ways. Uh, she did very important reporting on uh, on a house the president's wife, the current president's wife, bought in a sweet deal with a um, government contractor who had rated, greatly benefited from government contracts in the state of Mexico where the president had been a governor. Am I correct in that? Absolutely right. Okay. Um, so she reported on that, and she lost her job. Okay. So uh, uh, now she has other jobs. She's in CNN in Spanish, and, and she has other radio uh, jobs. But the one she had at the moment, she lost because of this. So, um, yes, economic pressures also uh, uh, are still at work. Okay? But the big concern, the great problem right now is violence. And you will see why uh, when I inform you of some of the statistics. At this moment, organized crime, and I've spoken to journalists who have told me about this, organized crime at this moment sometimes simply dictates the headline. There are provincial, regional newspapers and radio stations, TV stations in Mexico that get marching orders from them on the topics that they are interested in. Okay, So they will call and they will say, you will say nothing of yesterday's murder, or you will say, and they will give it their spin. And I've spoken to colleagues, Ambassador, personally, to colleagues who have said this to me. Those are personal conversations, but the same thing has been published, and I'll quote from some of those interviews in a minute. Uh, journalists are murdered, but they are also kidnapped. And sometimes, when they're lucky, they're released with a message. Okay? <laughs> they're released with a message for the newsroom. And sometimes they're not released. Uh, the journalist whose body was discovered sadly yesterday um, had been kidnapped, and uh, his body was found um, burned and uh, buried in Michoacán. Uh, this has gotten to the point where newspapers have closed, and I'll give you examples, and where journalists decide to be something else, um, which is quite different than what happens in Costa Rica, because I am a, originally a lawyer, 
and eventually I saw the light <laughs> and decided to go into journalism. Um, um, when, when you look at, at what's, hap what's happening uh, in Mexico you, right now with journalists, there is a true atmosphere of terror, and it is completely justified. Mexico is the third most dangerous country in which to be a journalist, behind Syria and Afghanistan. This is according, according to Reporters Without Borders, an international uh, group that studies these things and defends freedom of the press. Um, between the year 2000 and today, 105 journalists were murdered for reasons directly related to their work, according to the Mexican authorities. However, there are more than 50 murders uh, of journalists where the causes have not been confirmed. Therefore, they don't enter into the accounting of journalists killed because of their work. These statistics sometimes vary because of that, because what I will be referring to are strictly journalists killed because of their work, which is uh, a doubly troubling murder because they are also murdering ideas, uh, information, and democracy. So we're going to be talking about journalists murdered because of their work. So the statistics vary because that introduces a bit of subjectivity into it. Uh, but in general, uh, there have been 105 murders with because of the journalist's work, and there are 50 more murder journalists where that nexus has not been established between their work and the crime. Um, in Veracruz, which is within the third more, most dangerous country, one of the most dangerous states, or the most dangerous, between 2010 and 2017, uh, 17 journalists have been killed. 11 of them, the motives have not been completely established, and three have been disappeared. So you can bet that at least nine journalists were killed in those seven years, only in the state of Veracruz. The problem is intensifying. In 2015, there were 14 murders confirmed to be because of what the journalist's work was. In 2016, there were 11. And uh, counting yesterday's um, uh, unfortunate uh, news, uh, there have been already seven journalists killed because of the work this year. Uh, but between 2010 and 2016, there were, because remember now we're only talking about murders, but there were 798 crimes against journalists, according to the special prosecutor that deals with this in Mexico. And that includes, of course, kidnappings and um, getting beaten up, uh, assaults. Kidnappings and assaults. Now, when, we're ta when we talk about assaults, we're not talking about three muggers getting a journalist and kicking him around in a corner. We're talking about cutting off the tongue, the tongue to, as happened uh, to more than one journalist, as a, uh, a message for other journalists not to speak up. Uh, the basic impulse behind all of these cr crimes is, as the ambassador well pointed out, impunity. And that takes us to the field of, of the rule of law you were talking about. The Belisario Dominguez Institute of the Mexican Senate estimates impunity in 99.75% in the case of murdered journalists, murdered because of their work again. 99.75% of the cases. And, and, and you have to really think about that. 
number, 99.75% of journalists murdered go unpunished. Nobody is brought to face the law. Exactly. So it is impunity that is fueling uh, this enormous wave of violence uh, towards journalists. Um, now, Mexico has tried, has formally, and, and this is very interesting vis-a-vis -vis what the, the, the ambassador was saying, because he was saying we need the rule of law. We have not been able to, to make that catch up yet. Now, formally, there have been efforts. Now, remember, as I tell you what the efforts have been, remember 99.75%. Okay? So, um, in 2006, a special prosecutor's office for uh, crimes committed against freedom of expression, freedom of the press, was created as an office of the Attorney General's office in Mexico. So we have a special attorney, state attorney, appointed to investigate specifically cases where freedom of the press or freedom of expression uh, have been, um, uh, are, are involved, okay? And we still have 99.75% impunity. In 2013, the Constitution was amended uh, to give federal prosecutors uh, more jurisdiction, more ju uh, a wider jurisdiction over crimes um, where freedom of the press or, or expression is involved. And we have 99.75% impunity. The laws necessary uh, to apply that constitutional amendment to bring it um, into specific... Uh, um, what would you call it, to, to translate it into everyday life, the constitutional amendment, have already been, uh, have already gone through Congress. So they are laws of the republic, and we still have 99.75% impunity. Uh, Mexican legislators, uh, an example is the state of Colima, have followed Colombia's steps, and they have made... Um, uh, when, when the victim of homicide is a journalist, that is an aggravating circumstance in Colombia. Many Mexican states have adopted that, and we still have 99.75% impunity. Um, there are um, the, uh, mechanisms, federal mechanisms for the protection of journalists um, uh, have been established, and we still have 99.75% impunity. The Special Prosecutor's Office has been able to prosecute successfully three cases. Okay, three cases. Um, and even then, you rarely have, you know, from... from uh, at least, even if the case is not prosecuted, or even if it is, you rarely have an indication of uh, um, the masterminds behind the murder, uh, the higher-ups. Um, in those three cases, you got basically the small fry. Okay? And the real motives um, uh, rarely come to, to light. Uh, there was um, a case which is cited by the Committee to Protect Journalists in New York that does a wonderful job in throughout the Americas and uh, specifically in Mexico. I have worked closely with them. Um, Committee to Protect Journalists, CPJ. Um, they uh, investigated a case in which a former high police officer, high-level police officer in Oaxaca, was sentenced to 30 years. It's one of these three cases. But uh, doubts are abundant as to who, he pulled the trigger, but who actually uh, uh, ordered this, what the real motives were. Uh, that always remains. 
in a cloud. So the 0.25% of cases that do not um, benefit from immunity are still not completely cleared up. Um, this problem with impunity has been acknowledged by President Peña Nieto, and it had been acknowledged um, by his predecessors. Um, the president said that uh, he will, he, he trusts that a judicial reform that is being um, put forward in Mexico at this moment uh, will help, but nothing <coughs> will substitute uh, political will, the will uh, to produce, to truly produce change. Um, at the moment, censorship and self-censorship are very openly practiced. Um, a newspaper editor in a recent interview uh, said that instead of speaking of drug traffickers when um, they have armed confrontations, they speak of, quote, civilian, armed civilian citizens. So you have armed civilian citizens shooting it out for control of the drug trade here and there. Um, it, in some of the regions that are most affected, newspapers have closed. That's the case of El Norte in Ciudad Juarez. Oscar Cantu, its uh, editor-in-chief, um, in its the last issue, uh, said that basically the paper was closing because of impunity. Um, journalists are quitting their jobs. Ildebrando de Andar, uh, a editor of El Mañana of Tamaulipas, was quoted as saying, in Matamoros, they say whether we publish or do not publish something. They control the editorial policy. And this is the editor-in-chief. Um, this, and, and you can say it's, you could think it's a cowardly attitude. It's not. His newsroom was invaded by four men with ski masks um, who, in front of, of everyone, went in. Um, they beat up the editor, the editor in chief of the newspaper, this is the publisher, the other man, Enrique Juarez, and they told him he would die if he continued to publish stories where he didn't include names and where euphemisms such as armed uh, citizens, whatever, were used for publishing that. His new newsroom was invaded by these four men. They beat him up and they told him, stop publishing that. Um, Javier Valdez Cárdenas, one of the latest uh, murders, uh, victims of murder, and, and you know, when we talk about bravery, uh, that's the reason there have been so many murders. Uh, Mexican journalists have been brave and heroic. That's the reason they're murdered, okay? So, um, you know, you could see some of these things I'm quoting with a, a degree of ambivalence, you know. Uh, you have to understand the circumstances and think of them. Um, Javier Valdez, who was killed in Sinaloa, said, uh, we live in newsrooms infiltrated by the traffickers and next to colleagues you don't know whether you can trust. That is a very tough way to be a journalist. As a Costa Rican journalist, I have faced many pressures, including, I, I, we were talking with Mr. Murray in the green room. Um, I started my career investigating uh, uh, drug trafficking and its relationship to politics at a time when our country's politics had been infiltrated by the then big Colombian cartels, which have now split up into a myriad of smaller things. Um, I have faced uh, threats, and uh, uh, some serious ones, but it's a field day. 
compared to all of this. So really, my hat's off to my Mexican colleagues. They are heroes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the invitation from Ambassador Derenblum and from my panelists, from whom I've learned much. I appreciate being here. Thank you so much. Uh, <coughs> everyone knows the ravages of the drug trade and what it imposes on any nation caught in its net. But in my experience, few observers really see the degree to which it is incompatible with governance, with economic development, and with the, uh, the form of life that operates under the rule of law. And I want to explore some of those additional dimensions from the obvious ones today. Uh, I'm sure, uh, not knowing how much you know, I will give a brief history of the direct trade between Mexico and the United States regarding drug production. Obviously, Mexico has long served as a traditional marijuana source for the U.S., uh, gradually moved itself into Michoacan uh, heroin uh, poppy field production that produced black tar heroin that captured a large share of the U.S. market, relatively low level, low purity, uh, and moved out to capture mostly the west of the Mississippi market of the United States. Well, South American heroin, much of it from Colombia, penetrated the rest of the market. And after having driven out Southeast Asia and Afghanistan as sources, those two uh, source countries predominated the U.S. heroin market up until very recently, actually. Uh, further, the Mexican cartels quickly took over, uh, first as middlemen transitors and then finally in control of the trade of the Colombian cocaine market. 95% uh, of the U.S. market in cocaine comes from Colombia. They had been delivered directly. The Mexicans intervened, and the cartels took control of that as well, and their revenue soared incredibly from control of the cocaine trade. With immigration patterns and gang distributions in U.S. cities, they became predominant providers and traffickers in many drugs well beyond marijuana, obviously, with heroin and now cocaine. Uh, the Plan Colombia came into play from the Clinton administration through the first two administrations of George W. Bush. Uh, Plan Colombia was really quite successful in driving down Colombian contributions for both heroin and particularly for cocaine. It fell as much as 75% between 2001 and uh, 2012, or at about 700 metric tons down to about 165 metric tons. An extraordinary success that they were able to drive down both of those drugs out of Colombia. Colombia was stabilized. But the net result was, for the Mexican cartels, disaster. They lost revenue, incredibly. They lost authority and control over this, over this uh, traffic. They began to send their emissaries deeper and deeper into South America, trying to recapture the cocaine trade, but they needed to replace revenue. Methamphetamine production became a primary means of producing the of reducing the lost revenue, and then eventually began to ramp up very steeply opium poppy cultivation and heroin production. Uh, Mexican production soared, principally from the end of the President Calderon administration, 2006 to 2012. At the end of that administration, 2012, Mexican heroin poppy production soared from around 20-some metric tons per year, roughly more than the U.S. traditionally consumes in a single year, to over 70 metric tons in three years by 2015. That's an extraordinary explosion of supply and production at the Mexican level. The U.S. market was suddenly inundated with high-quality, pure cocaine because the Mexicans had learned from the Colombians' processing techniques that could easily supplant the relatively low-quality black tar heroin that had predominated the Mexican market previously. They now had a very high, pure, potent, white Mexican-produced heroin that was able to penetrate and capture U.S. markets, take it away from the Colombians and any other player. And then there we have the resultant explosion, abetted, of course, by pharmaceutical production of opiate prescription drugs in the United States, creating new market opportunities that have broken out of the urban environments of traditional heroin consumption into every sector, demography, and state in the United States with the uh, epidemic crisis of the current moment, uh, with, as you may know, from the last year for which we have data, the CDC being quite retrograde and producing official figures on time, we have 2015 data. Uh, that's all we can see visibly. 52,404 Americans dead in a single year from drug overdoses, 33,000 of which were opiate-related drugs. And since 2015, we have not seen the final figures, but I assure you, it is climbing even more steeply. It is, in fact, accelerating away. 2016 numbers are up dramatically. Earliest indications we have from states that collect this information 
or that 2017 will be an extraordinary explosion, and we could conceivably be looking at 80 to 100,000 Americans a year dying from the opiates. That is an extraordinary toll, an unprecedented toll, the worst crisis in drug uh, uh, epidemiology in, in U.S. history. Um, we've experienced this once before because the new contribution is the synthetics, fentanyl, carfentanyl, butyryl fentanyl. The, uh, the, these are coming in to a large degree manufactured in, as precursor chemicals in China, in some instances made by China, but in most instances still being shipped to Mexico where they're being added as adulterants or, as, or they're added as counterfeit pills to flood the U.S. market. The Mexican complicity, both in the heroin traditional market and now in the new synthetic market, has produced an incredible lethality that is not abating and seems to be rising. Trump administration inherits this. They don't even know how to intervene. If they do have a good plan, the earliest we could even conceivably see an effect of their plan will be December of 2018 before we'll even know if we've made a difference. That's how bad the overrun is of this accelerating crisis. It's simply out of control. Abetting that, because of the last three, four years of turning away from responsibility for international programs, we lost control of Colombia with regard to cocaine production, which is surging back in extraordinary capacity. Because they stopped enterprises against the supply and working towards the peace deal with the FARC and so forth, we have now seen that Colombian cocaine production for the last year on record has now 710 metric tons, where we were at 700 metric tons back in 2001. Pure cocaine flooding the U.S. market, coming overland through Santam into Mexico, and the cartel revenues are extraordinary. When these two epidemics strike together in the American heartland, the revenues and the deaths will be even more striking than they are today. Uh, Mexicans, by the way, in control of the cartels of this cocaine trade are now operating globally. If the U.S. market were to disappear tomorrow, the trade would be sustained because cocaine in Europe, cocaine in Russia, cocaine in Asia, cocaine in Australia, even in China it's found, much less the predominant consumers of cocaine today are Italy and Argentina, the higher rates per capita. So the global market will sustain this trade almost independently of what happens in the United States, though this is a huge area where demand is high and revenue is strong. So this has gotten a little bit out of control. The cocaine cartel revenue is staggering. Add to that now the uh, methamphetamine, the uh, marijuana trade, which continues unabated with the increased prevalence in U.S. states. Uh, the other thing we need to attend to is traditionally we've divided countries in our analytic perspective between producer nations and consumer nations. So traditionally you had... Uh, relatively underdeveloped spaces of the world, Afghanistan, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, producer nations that then transited it through traffickers to consumer nations, you know, the UK or uh, the United States or Canada for that matter. That simply must be dis dispelled now. It is no longer a dichotomy that's sustainable. Uh, both the United States has itself become a producer nation, and we can return to that in a little bit about legalization and its implications. Uh, of various drugs. At the same time, and this is very threatening, and I'm not sure the Mexican government has fully accommodated this realization, consumer nations spread themselves and the producer nations catch the disease. He who sups with the devil must have a long spoon. It was for a long time believed that we could simply move the drugs through our own domains and the Yankees would pay the price and the money would flow back. Well, the money did come back. The arms came back as well, the weapons. But what also came back was the patterns of consumption. And so that increasingly Mexico is now facing a potential youth crisis of consumption and prevalence rates in Mexico itself. Their own generation is at risk now for marijuana consumption, for uh, cocaine and methamphetamine consumption, and perhaps, as we shall see, this heroin overdose crisis may well strike there as well, particularly given the fungibility and movement of the synthetic drugs coming so readily through the mails, through various activities that are available that will presumably morph into the countries that have heretofore been producer nations will now find that they have caught the disease. The drug trade presents, therefore, an existential threat to the developing state, both for its violent subversion of governance and for its damage to public health, to public education, and to the future labor force. 
along with its attendant corruption of the judiciary and of everyday economic transactions. There's a common narrative many of us have absorbed, especially over the last eight years, that is wrong. It is the notion that it is U.S. demand that creates this crisis and the U.S. was culpable. This is a very striking notion. It's partially true. It was particularly advanced by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton when she first took office as Secretary of State, that U.S. culpability was the driving force and that Mexico was the victim. It's only somewhat the case. You can change U.S. demand, as I say, and the market would continue regardless. Nonetheless, there is some joint culpability here across the transit and trafficker nations as well as the consumer nations for where the money comes from. However, what the emphasis of the last administration had been was to focus on U.S. pharmaceutical products and the FDA and the notion that it was the opiate prescriptions from doctors that had created the crisis of the opiate overdose deaths. Somewhat true, but not totally the whole story. What they really ignored was the actual active role of cross-border illicit traffic from Mexico that continued to be a crisis. And one reason that they ignored this, withdrew from international partnerships, from interdiction in the transit zone, and from playing a strong role at the border was because the political narrative of the time was had been captured by their political opponent, who was eager to point fingers at the Mexican trade, the cartels, the drug violence, and the role of illicit movement of heroin into the United States as a cause of the crisis. Both are true, but because the political narrative played into the hands of their opponents, there was a tendency to completely ignore that dimension or to downplay that dimension. It was also a movement on the part of the administration to dismiss the war on drugs as futile, uh, wrong-headed, counterproductive, leading to massive arrests and incarceration, leading to worse outcomes because it enabled violence and sustained it, because it didn't realize that by legalizing or decriminalizing drugs, so they argued, we would drive out the black market, we would make drugs safer for consumption, we would reduce uh, the drug use by treatment and prevention initiatives, and we would move towards the sunny uplands where drugs would be accommodated in our presence, but managed and guarded and regulated. That's true, proven to be a fantasy. Nowhere that we know historically or, or uh, geographically has that ever worked. You still end up with a black market with increased prevalence, with worse products, and worse public health as well as law enforcement dimensions. And that unfortunately has happened not only to ourselves, but will happen to other countries if they move in the direction of decriminalization, and we know this historically. These claims have not proven true. Historically, I don't, I'm not an expert in Mexican politics. I have them sitting here beside me, but I do know enough to remember. Under the PRI, there was a sense of the PRI of relative, not so much impunity, but there was more accommodation to the presence of the drug trade. Under Ernesto Zedillo, for all his accomplishments, there was still a kind of posture of relative accommodation of a business enterprise as long as the peace was kept, as long as certain lines were, were crossed. Under the PAN, that changed somewhat dramatically to a certain degree under Vicente Fox, who was a reasonable partner with the United States in this regard, but not as enthusiastic, perhaps, certainly not as much as Felipe Calderon was, who put much political capital on the line fighting this, who actually grasped the nettle <coughs> and faced this phenomenon and paid a heavy political price for it, we should acknowledge, which, of course, was the extraordinary violence that ensued and escalated and the homicide rate. But still, this is the choice. Do you take the path of resistance, or do you take the path of accommodation? Which one of them reduces violence? Well, we had the rest restoration of the PRI under, under uh, uh, Peninero. And what have we now seen in this last week? Record levels of homicide have restored themselves, have come right back at his throat, with a relative accommodation compared to Calderon. That is the movement of the police, the movement of the military, the attacks, the strikes against the, the providers and the distribution networks. You can relatively try to accommodate, and yet the violence still surges, in fact, maybe worse in many regards. Notice, by the way, that I'm highlighting these three from Zedillo through, through, through Calderon, through Peñanero. Very parallel stories can be told in Colombia, where we saw a very similar progression from Pastrana, who accommodated, to Uribe, who fought very hard and drove down the trade, to Santos, who now tries to accommodate and privilege peace, and we've seen the resurgence. 
One could even, I know I don't know where the story ends, but one could even find parallels with George W. Bush, President Obama, and perhaps Trump, who knows where it goes, what will be the policy. But that this movement of oscillation towards strong resistance, then back into accommodation and an effort to sort of appease and try to make peace and to try better, a better way, perhaps to criminalize. This has been a common theme, a conceit <coughs> of, of all of North American nations for, for a while now. And my suspicion is that this has actually been a disaster. Um, by the way, the surging homicide rates in Mexico are probably attributed to this control of the heroin trade. Uh, in Guerrero and other places where we've seen heavy uh, opium cultivation, this, they're vying for turf over the control of the very lucrative heroin trade. These synthetics and the semi-synthetics like fentanyl that come from abroad through precursor chemicals may to some degree undermine traditional heroin production, at least the old Michoacan, black tar, poppy, these are not cultigens that are now coming in that are driving the opioid overdoses. They are chemicals manufactured like methamphetamine was manufactured with precursors. And they may undermine or evade the traditional control of the safe havens where opium poppy was, was grown, which we shall see. It's a complex market. Uh, <clears throat> so do we have better policy to choices? I would say that George W. Bush paralleled Calderon and they worked in partnership with the PON in efforts to suppress the drug trade, to att attack the drug trafficking networks, and to create international partnerships that led to eradication, strong efforts at transit zone interdiction activities with multiple uh, resources available from a cooperation with U.S. and host country militaries that worked fairly effectively, strong border control, and attacks within domestically the drug trafficking and distribution organizations were possible. Much of that was reversed under different policy choices with President Obama, who turned away from the notion of controlling supply, who d deliberately neglected and or undermined the funding for international programs such as Plan Colombia or engagements with Mexico in various regards. The money was undercut and the incentive was there and U.S. leadership said, oh no, we're no longer fighting the drug war, we're now moving towards a different public health model. Public health model is a good model, but you've got to supplement it with the supply and availability attack, or you will lose control of this issue. My impression is the Obama years also saw the fostering of a different normative attitude. The legalization out of Colorado, Washington State, and now multiple states of high potency, concentrated products of marijuana have led to a proliferation of drug trades in the United States that have been capitalized upon by foreign partners. Colombians are present in Colorado. Chinese are present in Colorado and running grow ops. Cubans are present in Colorado doing indoor grows. Mexican cartels are working actively in the distribution. Colorado marijuana is so potent and so desirable that it's being smuggled out of Colorado, which is far easier than smuggling from Mexico where there's a border and interdiction. Colorado has become an international distribution center where drugs are going out of the United States to uh, markets elsewhere. And accompanying the marijuana market, we're now seeing the surge in the opiates, and the same cartels who are polydrug distributors are gaining revenue. The norms of legalization have not driven out the black market. They have enhanced. This may raise a question in the back of your mind, of what avail is a border wall when the cartels are here? Of what avail is a border wall, however, for the Mexicans who can simply go to Europe and Argentina to sell the product? So the border wall may be an important dimension, but it is no means a sufficient response to the crisis. Oh, my time is short here. Why don't I get to, we can talk about uh, this will morph, and my impression is both Canada and Mexico are soon to experience a public health disaster somewhat parallel to what the U.S. has experienced with inclined uh, prevalence rates and the, uh, the youth that will be uh, undermined by this and the public health catastrophe, which is far more consequential in fragile nations and underdeveloped nations. When a hurricane hits Honduras, the toll is far greater than when a hurricane hits Florida. The absence of infrastructure, public health response, law enforcement, and judiciary, and the rest, it means that the drug trade as a hurricane produces consequences that are almost overwhelming 
for fragile nations, for developing nation states. But I want to turn my last attention here uh, by <coughs> minutes. What, what are the uh, consequences for our development objectives in nations that we wish to foster and see grow governance and grow their economies? Uh, many economists were beguiled initially by the notion of the drug trade since it seemed to bring in cash flow. And cash flow looked like it was good, it was beneficial. The value of all this money coming from the drug trade seemed to be potentially something that could prime capitalism. Well, what kind of capitalism was it? It was pirate capitalism, in Weberian terms, not rational capitalism. The drug trade does not systematically reinvest in its own resources and the countries where it exists. The drug trade does not get taxed. There are no customs payments here. The drug trade is incompatible with the notion of gradually developing economic bases with systematic reinvention, uh, re reinvestment. The drug trade, in fact, is extractive and exploitative. It reaches in and takes a product for which it pays very little money at farm gate and needs dependent peasants, oftentimes coerced or terrorized peasants, who grow the product at the, at the point of a gun. And it needs them dependent on their extractive capacity to take from that to an international market where they themselves, the kingpins and the trafficking cartel centers, become very, very wealthy indeed, billions and billions worth, as we well know, and gain political power and insulate themselves and impose violence and corruption as forms of business and put an exact a tax, as it were, on the rest of all the society's activities because of the corruption and the penalty that must be paid for bribery and the rest, as well as the fear, because new lawyers <coughs> settle disputes through the judiciary, you settle disputes with violence and coercion. It's extractive, and it gains wealth for itself. This should sound familiar to any student of Latin America, because it was called dependencia theory once upon a time. It was the notion that the great corporate uh, industrial centers of the developed world were practicing dependencia by deliberately sustaining relationships between the center and the periphery, where they kept the periphery poor and underdeveloped so that they could produce tin, copper, and whatever resource was necessary. The drug trade has replicated this. It is a form of dependencia. They are extracting and exploiting and keeping down any potential development because it serves their purposes and enriching themselves by selling to the center. Well, the center gets hurt, indeed, but so will the periphery with the public health consequences, but it is extractive. And it is incompatible with our notions of economic development and sustainable development. As a matter of fact, the drug trade depends upon essential features to operate. Ideally, lawless havens, ungoverned spaces, it feasts on those. And where it does not find them, it will create them. And where it sees efforts to recreate governance and institutional stability, it will actively undermine them. In Afghanistan, in Bolivia, in Michoacan, it will seek to find ungovernable spaces because it can then find its labor force. It will extract the labor force from productive enterprises and shove it into gangs, paramilitaries, and or make them sicken by the use of the drugs themselves. They need that labor force. They need ungoverned spaces, and they will create them. And if you come in with development activities, through either private activities or Department of State and, and efforts to create USAID and so forth that we see in Colombia, they become targets. <laughs> because the drug traffickers know that signals the end of their unlimited capacity and control. They will attack the schools, they will attack the roads, they will attack the hospitals, or they'll capitalize on them to get to the port that they'll take over and ship their drugs in containers up into Seattle. So they are enemies of development, and if they have the dominant hand, they will establish the norms of violence, coercion, and extraction, and they will undermine, if not destroy, every effort to liberate the economy or to provide governments with enfranchisement, political participation. Our citizens react. <laughs> Citizens react by target hardening, creating security, spending money in the middle class on security forces, on even paramilitaries and vigilante groups, because they're operating under coercion. This is doubly extractive and demoralizing to the economy. And then you get a 
A, a laundering exchange is now set up to launder the funds that come down. You ever seen the black market Facebook exchange operate in, in Colombia? They used to send down tractors and combines, farm equipment, industrial equipment that were bought illegally under a black market peso exchange with a money laundering operation, the net effect of which was to not pay any customs on these imports and to undermine the legitimate market in tractors, machinery. It was so counterproductive that this is the threat that the drug trade poses to any government services. Ultimately, in some instances, the drug trade itself will try to supplant the state. As you saw with uh, Knights Templari, <coughs> you saw with various groups, they will occupy an area and be, become an enemy of governance and an enemy of the state, provide services on its terms to the citizens and almost secede, as it were, from integration in the wider economy. So we've seen this in Afghanistan, we see it in Colombia, we see it to some degree in Mexico as well. What are your choices? This is what happens when you accommodate. It's still, it, if the drugs present a disease model, from the societal perspective, that disease is cancer. It is incompatible with the life of the state. Even Marxist governments recognize this point. One of the few strong partners we had in fighting the drug trade in Central America was Nicaragua. They did so because they recognized these are alternative centers of control. We don't like people having allegiances to something other than the state. And they were active in suppressing. Because they recognized these are alternatives. People, they, they want a monopoly <laughs> control. You, you cannot accommodate the drug trade and still operate the goals and objectives of development, of modernization, of integration, of enfranchisement, of governance, of the rule of law. So what is the other option? To fight. But this is futile, we are told. But this is bloody. But this will cost you politically. It's cancer. You can cut it out, or you can leave it be. Either way, it's, it's not the health of the state that you'll end up with. Best not to let it get its strength. But once <coughs> it is there, it will strike at your throat. And if you oscillate your policies every year, if you switch from left to right, from appeasement to accommodation to resistance, all you will do is energize this thing that will spring back at your throat as soon as you turn your back. I don't see any other way out other than the responsibility to fight it, to take it on directly. And it will be a perpetual fight, one that you cannot yield to, any more than the fight for justice, the fight against poverty, the fight for literacy, the fight against drugs will probably be a long-term thing that has to happen for every generation. and has to be renewed and sustained across administrations with its policies effectively. Any other response is going to guarantee that you're losing ground and ultimately losing your future as you lose a generation. We can come back to this in questions, but that's my sense is that these choices are actually pretty clear. It's the political will to resist impunity, to impose the will of law, the rule of law, and to take the consequences, but you must educate the people as to why you're doing it and enlist them in your support. Finally, and that can only be done effectively with international partnerships. We are all of us threatened by this in the United States and in Mexico. It's our children, our educational system, our effort at governance. We don't have to wall ourselves into this compartment against that compartment. Properly understood, it is a joint responsibility throughout the hemisphere, in fact, throughout the world, to resist transnational criminal organizations that are capitalizing on this and running very fast with enormous revenues, and they are at the moment gaining ground. Thank you. Very good. Very good, David. Very good. We have uh, time for a few questions, and uh, we're going to do it in a very democratic way. I'll pick <laughs> from the left and from the right, alternatively, for the questions. Yes. Please give us your name and affiliation, please. Yeah, Zip Train American University. For Mr. Gonzalez, uh, would you turn yourself into a legislator since you're a lawyer? Uh, since you know that it's 99.75% that journalists will be eliminated with impunity, I think you are, uh, because you have a background in law, why wouldn't you be a legislator? 
Uh, no, I don't think it's a legislative matter. Uh, I, I remember we, we reviewed several of the actions Mexico has taken that go from the amendment of the Constitution and the approval of the laws uh, to make that amendment uh, um, have effect in real life, in day-to-day -day life, to the creation of a special prosecutor's office, to the aggravation of the crime of, of murder when the victim is a journalist. Uh, I think in the end, it's a matter of will. It's, it's, uh, it's really deciding to make the rule of law um, 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 be completely respected and the will um, to fight these things. Now, if, if I may just interject a brief comment on what Mr. Murray just said. I think Costa Rica's case illustrates a lot of what you're saying. Uh, Costa Rica is not a producer, and it is a transit country simply because it's sitting there between Colombia and Mexico and the U.S. Um, our waters are what are mostly used, and of course we don't have a big navy. We do have an agreement with the U.S. to jointly patrol, and, and that has worked well. Uh, but our territory is used for some amount of trafficking. Uh, now that brings tremendous consequences to our very small nation. Um, first of all, when they go through Costa Rica, they pay Costa Rican help with drugs. So that drug stays in the country. And that creates an internal market, which is what you were saying. And that makes Costa Rica have uh, an, addiction, an addiction problem, small compared to neighboring countries, but it's still an important and growing country. So Costa Rica could point fingers to the south and say, you guys produce, and to the north and say, you guys consume. And where would that get us? I think we have to stop the finger pointing. The U.S. does have a responsibility in this, a big one. So does Mexico. And I don't think Costa Rica can shun its responsibility, however small or large it may be. We have to get a common perspective on this, and we have to uh, deal with it uh, together. Uh, pointing fingers, oh, but the U.S., well, the money laundering, where does it take place? And then the weapons they buy, where do they buy them? And then they come back south, and it, it, it doesn't make sense. Look, in Costa Rica, we've had big drug traffickers with names such as Casey, last names, um, uh, Foley from California. Yeah. Uh, they were established. Oh, we've had mafiosos from New York. <laughs> okay. <laughs> established in Costa Rica using our country for their purposes. This problem does not have borders, and we have to face it that way. We have to work towards a common perspective, and I very much agree with Mr. Murray on that. Uh, if we don't stop the finger pointing and turn this into an argument of who is more culpable, um, and I'm talking from the perspective of a country that could possibly claim to be the least culpable, okay, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, so we have to, and the other thing is that it's not only uh, the war on drugs. I think there is also a health issue, a public health issue that is involved here. And every country has to respond to that also. Thank you, Armand. A question on this side? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Mike Lally. I'm with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, any, and this could go to anyone on the panel, but the impact of the NAFTA negotiations going on right now and what the impact would be specifically on the drug trade if NAFTA was rolled back or restricted in some way? This is for you, David. Uh, no, 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 I think an ambassador who has served his country knows this well. So uh, there is a big impact. <laughs> There is a big, big impact on this. Uh, the whole narrative, <coughs> uh, questioning NAFTA, questioning the relationship between the regional partnership, has an impact on the violent crime. As Dr. Murray mentioned, there's been a lot of cooperation 
on the Mexican side, uh, a lot of it has brought about, about big political costs by the Mexican government when they, for instance, authorize uh, U.S. agents to operate in Mexico armed to share information or all these things have have a political cost in Mexico. And I think the Mexican population have been brought along in the thought that we are a partnership, that, that as a region we act together. So when you question the partnership, and mind you, it's happening all at the same time. It's not only NAFTA, it's Mexicans are rapists, is we want to deport them all, and we want to build a wall. So it's hard to bring the Mexican public along to fight this fight that, let's agree, is a regional problem, but there is a big component of finger pointing, and there, is some easy, there are some easy answers. Even if they're wrong, it's compelling <coughs> for a political players to just point the finger to the north and say, this is a U.S. problem, we shouldn't be fighting it. Maybe it's wrong, but populists, by the way, do come to power on the wrong assumptions. So it, it encourages this type of narrative. And I'll give you one last example how this narrative affects uh, the fight on, on, on drugs. Because of the composition of the Mexican police force, the, the majority of the Mexican police are in the municipal level, followed by the state level. I'm sorry to say, but they are the most corrupt police in Mexico. So the way the government has addressed this is bringing the military, the armed forces, to fight uh, the war or organized crime. Now, the Mexican armed forces are composed mainly of the lower socioeconomic classes. I'd venture to say 100% of them have relatives living in the United States illegally. And 100% of them are getting stories of how their relatives are living in fear in the United States now, fear of being deported, and all this narrative against them. And that's what they're hearing on a daily basis while their Mexican authorities tell them, but we got to wage this war for the region. For Mexico, of course, for Mexico, but also, and again, there is this narrative that it's a U.S. problem. Wrongly so, but the narrative is there. So it's harder to bring them along to wage this war when one of the partners is not only not helping, but blaming, criticizing, and pointing fingers. It makes it difficult. It does. Okay. Go ahead. Just a sec. I just want to make a quick comment. Um, uh, name? Oh, my name is Maury Efrak. This is my wife, Adriana. She's from Mexico. I'm from Israel. And uh, I want to make a quick comment. We've been married since 82, and I've been fascinated with Mexico, especially from the uh, um, standpoint of what's possible. Um, always frustrated with the fact that Mexico has so much uh, promise from the standpoint of natural resources, young people, desire, hard work, and so forth. Um, and to see all of this is just, through the years, has been just heartbreaking. Um, but I would like to go ahead and um, mention that you know, <coughs> having seen what Israel has accomplished in 70 years, with very little as compared to what Mexico has been struggling with with so much, leaves a lot of optimism still that, like you said, if there's a real will, there's going to be a way to find a solution. Okay. Uh, uh, hi, my name is John Mann. I'm an intern at the Hudson Institute. And uh, before I begin, thank you all for coming and uh, sharing your knowledge with everyone. It's very interesting. Um, my question, I guess, is more directed towards Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Murray because you guys mentioned Colombia. And though there has been a resurgence in the past year of increased cocaine production and exportation, during two, between 2000 and 2014, we saw a lot of progress in Colombia, like 90% reduction in drug-related kidnappings, 46% reduction in homicides, 71% reduction in terrorist attacks, and things of that nature. So two really quick questions. One, do you think that those massive reductions in all those different types of social problems were due to external U.S. support through Plan Colombia and the training of Colombian forces by the United States, 
or a domestic prerogative of the Uribe administration? And second, do you think that similar strategies could be implemented or would work in Mexico? Um, Colombia's case is particularly difficult because, uh, as I think I mentioned, um, you don't know where the line is between the paramilitary, uh, the guerrillas, and the drug trafficking. Uh, they were pretty much um, uh, the same thing um, to a great extent. Uh, when Uribe um, uh, behaved very aggressively, not only towards uh, the, drug, the guerrillas, but also towards the drug trafficking, I think you have to admit with criticisms that are valid to that administration, um, it played its hand a bit too hard at times. You have to admit that there was great progress made, and you certainly have to admit that if Colombia is on the road to um, um, away from a failed state, uh, Uribe's policies have uh, quite a bit to do with that. Uh, having said that, the current uh, peace negotiations, for example, in Costa Rica, have us in fear of what our public security min minister has called um, uh, a tsunami of drugs going north, and you, Costa Rica gets hit by that inevitably uh, because of the peace agreement. You see, some of these guerrillas and paramilitaries, because they have been in that business for so long, and the whole political discourse was pretty much an excuse. Um, they may demobilize as guerrillas, but they remain as cartels. And the current government's policies towards uh, the um, growing of, of uh, coca and the eradication uh, has been somewhat lenient, and the combination of those two things, we fear, will cause that tsunami which our uh, minister uh, uh, mentions. I completely agree. Uh, Colombia is a remarkable example of something that was unprecedented in our experience. It's <coughs> a model in many regards for many parts of the world. Colombian National Police advised the Afghans, uh, for heaven's sakes. But on the other hand, we have to be acknowledged potential differences, and both are true. There is a model in the Columbia enterprise that can be exported reasonably successful, but we have to also see features that were peculiar. Columbia is 42, 43 million people, highly entrepreneurial, does not have a very large indigenous caste or class of group of people, ethnicity, uh, unlike Mexico. Uh, doesn't have a mestizo population, for instance. Doesn't have Guatemala's problems with a lack of enfranchisement, integration of, of large numbers of the, of the populace. Mexico is 120 million, 120, 120 million people. Demographically diverse and structured and still a more of a Spanish feudal hierarchy that's present in many regards with contrasts and difficulties uh, economically and politically and integration have never been fully accomplished. To some degree, the Colombia challenge was different. Second thing is, Colombia led the program with political will and leadership that was native to them in partnership with the U.S. We put a lot of money into it. We put a lot of resources into it. We had certain authorities and rules that we could bring to bear because this arc was, after all, seen as a terrorist organization. The U.S. could do certain things that you can't necessarily do in strict law enforcement activities. Nonetheless, it was the Colombians who led and the Colombians who made this achievement possible. In the absence of that partnership at the strong central level, it's very difficult to accomplish that. We have no such partner in Afghanistan, for instance. It's very difficult to put, bolt on to something there. In Colombia, you had a subversive ideological group that was in revolt that happened to use cocaine to get rich and do things with it, to energize themselves. In Mexico, you have criminal activities of multiple types, from the Zetas to the Templares to the Zeta, away you go, the, 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 who are not really ideologically driven, but they become an existential threat to the state. 
but not because they are necessarily mobilized around a, 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 you know, the, the, the flag of, of uh, socialist progress. So it's a different type of undertaking. And then one can also invoke the famous, <coughs> you know, poor Mexico is so close to the United States, so far from God. The, the flow of arms and money and the relationship with the U.S. is different. It's been extremely difficult to build effective partnerships across the border to vet units, to eliminate corruption. At the same time, the U.S.'s hands are not pure in this regard, and we've had our own difficulties sustaining this. And just as there is a political value to consolidate and attract your populist support by finding friends and, and enemies in the global scene, shall we say that Mexico has found it also politically convenient sometimes to say, you see, we are united in at least resisting the U.S. and their sovereignty and their presence here and their efforts to help us. How dare they? And so forth. I mean, it has served politicians on every side. It can be a model. We have to mitatis mitandis to take the Colombian understanding, which is an unprecedented success, that did establish governance, rule of law, international investment flowed into Colombia. The economy boomed. The drug trade was driven down. Homicides, kidnappings, and even human rights were gained enormously. How does that model get adapted? I, I would let Mexicans who understand their society tell us better what needs to be changed and adapted. Jorge? No, I, I, I fully agree uh, with what Dr. Mary is saying. Uh, also, probably one of the... So the Plan Colombia was very successful, and the U.S. intervention there was very successful, and probably the, the equivalent, which would be the Plan Merida in Mexico, would mm -hmm. be just as successful. But as Dr. Mary says, there are different histories uh, between Colombia and Mexico. I mean, in Mexico, since grade school, you are taught that the United States stole half, half of our territory, that the U.S. invaded us, that 10 boy soldiers leaped to their death before being captured by the United States invaders. The United States is the root of all evil since you're six years old in Mexico. So it takes a lot to change that <clears throat> narrative and to bring the people along and say the U.S. is a partner. There was a, a seminal book called Distant Neighbors by a New York Times a correspondent in Mexico, Alan Writing, that said that the all power all-powerful uh, president of Mexico back in the one-party system could accomplish anything he wanted, and they were all his uh, during his six-year presidency, except two things. One, re-elect themselves, which they still cannot, and the second one, bring Mexico closer to the United States. Well, that started changing. That started changing. I think uh, we cooperate better now. Colombia never had those coasts to deal with. Mexico does, and that's why I come back and say, that's why it's such a huge setback when you have a U.S. president saying they're bringing drugs, the rapists. It's, it just takes us back to our initial fear that we're going to bed with the wrong person to begin with, that we trusted the wrong person. One last thing, uh, the Colombia and Mexico, Uribe, Calderon, they're very close friends. Uh, they remain very close friends. I assume they had the same idea for what the way they wanted to do things. Allow me to say something very unpopular here, by the way. I'm going to say something in defense of Trump. His political rhetoric is one thing. If we've observed this man as president, there's an extraordinary capacity that's been achieving remarkable things on the foreign policy that were vastly unexpected. I would wait and see how he engages with Mexico for real and how he engages the drug crisis for real. And we may find that given the team he has put together, there is far more reason for hope. Though there may be rhetorical inflammation, there may be difficulties to overcome, we should see how beneficial this might be and see what they actually produce. Maybe so. Maybe so. The problem that I insist is bringing the Mexican people along. And that, the narrative, the rhetoric does sure. have a direct effect. It's, uh, they're not waiting to see the results. They're just listening day after day after day, the criticism. And, and it does change people's perception. It, it, I mean, it'd be impossible to think that it won't. If I may give kind of a third party perspective from <laughs> <laughs> little Costa Rica. Uh, I, I, I knew that Mexico, that Mexico were, all of that resentment was uh, 
very, very evident and right on the surface. I also know a Mexico that has changed in that aspect tremendously. Now, I beg you to consider what has um, uh, made the change. Because the resentments are rooted in true historical um, uh, situations. Okay? What has, what has brought the change along? I think engagement. And I think the North American Free Trade Agreement is one of those things in which the U.S. has engaged Mexico in a very positive way. So if we have all of these common problems, um, shouldn't, be we, shouldn't we be looking for ways to engage uh, rather than for ways to withdraw and separate? I think that if we stop pointing fingers, that if we began trying, taking the advice of that Costa Rican ambassador I was uh, quoting at the beginning, uh, trying to learn more about each other, um, I think we could make great progress. And great progress has been made through engagement. Um, look, these are common problems. We have agreed on that. You don't want to fight them on the Rio Grande. You don't want to fight these fights on the Rio Grande. If you do that, you're going to lose. I think we can only win together. Well, we have uh, schedules here at Hudson, <laughs> and uh, I think they are. We, we, I was told 1.45, so we're one minute ahead. <laughs> In any case, let me or allow me to use the, the occasion to invite you to an event on Venezuela that we'll be having on July 26th. I think you, we have a wonderful team of speakers lined up, and I think we can learn a great deal from it. In the meantime, let's give a final round of applauses to our excellence.